Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. Welcome to another episode of Real Science Friday. I'm Bob Enyart. And I'm Fred Williams, creation speaker and software engineer. This is a real coup. You've got Lawrence Krauss, Dr. Lawrence Krauss, yeah. a leading physicist, I think one of the top five popular physicists in the whole world, and you debated him. He's an atheist. He's an and, evolutionist. Yep. You were debating this Aaron Raw. Yeah. And he mentioned Lawrence Krauss. And he, so, hey, hey, now you get the chance to say, well, right. okay, well, I'll just go interview the guy. It was a fun talk, but I do ask Lawrence Krauss at the beginning if he could help me because he's a theoretical physicist, emphasis on the theoretical. I'm a Bible teacher, pastor. So kind of like David versus Goliath without the slingshot. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so I ask him, Lawrence, could you help me? If you know that there are scientists who would agree with me, when we're disagreeing, you know the science better than I do. Would you help me out when I need help? Did he help you much? You know, he said he would as long as it's on the science. I said, yeah, that's what I want. I don't think he helped. Fred, there was one part where he schooled me, and rightly so. I made a mistake. Do you remember what that was? You listened to this one. Yeah, the uh, ratio of uh, electrons to protons, the uh, mass That's ratio, right. you had stated a number that was actually the standard deviation between the two. Standard so deviation. It's an easy mistake to but make. But it was a big mistake. I should have realized there's an even number. There's a one-to-one -one ratio of electrons to protons. We were talking about how the universe appears to be exquisitely fine-tuned, which he agreed to later in the debate. He agreed to that. But there are so many electrons and protons in the universe What's the likelihood that they're going to have a one-to-one -one relationship like on Earth? Men and women, there's a one-to-one -one relationship, but not perfect. It's, yeah, it's not quite one-to-one, -one, right? right? I think it's 51% women. Right, yeah, like that. But what if we found out of all the 7 billion people in the world, it was one man to one woman to not a thousandth of a percent or a millionth, but to a billionth of a percent. Like there's exactly the same number. We would be shocked. That would be real interesting data. That'd right. be like, wow, what's how, up with that? How could that be? So perfect. Well, in the whole universe, if you want to know how accurate is the one-to-one -one ratio of electrons to protons, it's one to 10 to the 37th with 37 zeros. That's not one in a trillion you know, quadrillion, quintillion, septillion, that's one to 10,000 decillion. It's like this perfect Huge, ratio. big number, yeah. Big. <laughs> and so why is it? And Lawrence Krauss never quite helped me out with that. No, he didn't point out that your no. 10 to the 37 was the deviation. So. No, he could have. But he could have, but he didn't. <laughs> he didn't. And he even uses a standard deviation argument himself later in our interview about the 2.7 degrees background temperature of the universe. Yes. Why don't we start the tape? Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. Welcome to another episode of Real Science Friday. I'm Bob Enyart, the pastor of Denver Bible Church. Today we will interview best-selling American science author Lawrence Krauss. Now, over in Europe, under the watchful eye of leading evolutionists, belief in atheistic origins is more popular than it is here in the U.S. For example, in America... 60% of U.S. medical doctors say that they believe that God was involved in the origin of life. Now, that's according to a survey run by evolutionists at a prestigious institute. And as reported in the journal Science, 60% of public school biology teachers, the same percentage coincidentally, do not endorse Darwinism in the classroom. So it's here in America where Lawrence Krauss, theoretical physicist, emphasis on the theoretical, is trying his best to convince us that not only is God unnecessary for life, but he's not necessary for the origin of the cosmos either. His latest book is Why Is There Something Rather Than Nothing, A Universe from Nothing. Dr. Krauss, welcome to Real Science Friday. Why do you think there is something rather than nothing? 
<laughs> because we can see it. First of all, I'm pretty sure there's not nothing. Yeah, that's... Uh, I, I'm reasonably certain empirically that that's a fact. Yeah, well, the fact may... on the telephone today is, is a good example. Yes, there um, are people I debate who would go off on a tangent at that point and deny that we could know anything. But I'm glad that you agree there is something. Oh, there absolutely is, yes. And uh, then uh, the question, the amazing thing is uh, how it's really, the, you know, for, from a scientific perspective, the really important thing is a how question, not a why question. Um, because what we really want to know is how everything we see, the galaxies of the 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe, each containing 100 billion stars, mm. uh, creating a Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, how all of that arose uh, potentially from nothing. And what is the amazing thing is when we look at the universe and measure what we've measured, uh, it is perfectly consistent with a universe that could spontaneously arise due to the laws of quantum mechanics from literally nothing. The total energy of the universe appears to be zero, which of course is kind of the th what you might expect of a universe that came from nothing. And everything we've discovered seems to point in that direction. Now, it's only a plausibility argument. We don't, we don't know the laws of physics back to t equals zero or before. We, we, we know it pretty close. We've been able to by, but with our machines in, in, at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, um, uh, recreate the conditions of the universe back to about a millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, mm. uh, and have made some recent discoveries of a major new particle the, well, uh, there. And so, but but what we what we've been able to say is that plausibly, yeah. it's certainly plausible, and it look, doesn't look like there's any need for any supernatural shenanigans. Now, the now, simple laws of physics will do it. Now, Lawrence Krauss, you know, as I've just introduced myself that I'm the pastor of Denver Bible Church. Yes. So if I end up disagreeing with you on a point, and you're able, with your knowledge, to confirm that there are many scientists who would agree with me, could you let the audience know? Because I might need your help in refuting you. Sure, yeah. As long <laughs> as we're, I mean, but yeah, if, if we're talking science, absolutely. Yeah, if we're talking science, you're a best-selling author. So I'd like to say to you that this is a well-written book, but that's a bit like telling a girl you met on a blind date that she has a great personality. <laughs> because I so disagree with what you write. But between you and Richard Dawkins, you guys concede fully half of the argument to us creationists and well, to well, the intelligent hold on a Let's just design step back folks. And say, how can you, I mean, yeah. the question is do you disagree with the science? And if so, what, uh, what's your scientific I, I, I love the science. Oh. I'm an amateur. I'm a radio talk show host for 22 years, five okay. days a week. I've debated people like Michael Shermer, mm -hmm. Eugenie Scott. Back in the 90s, mm -hmm. Eugenie Scott was on with me for an hour, and she said the best evidence for evolution was junk DNA. And I said, the Bible teacher, I said, well, Eugenie, don't you think it's too early in our study of genetics to conclude affirmatively that all this non-coding, all those regions are junk? And she said, we have it. We, we sell the DVD. She said, we absolutely know affirmatively that it has no function. Now, fast forward 15 years, and it's the Bible pastor who was right. Well, and one I mean, of the people, world's leading okay. atheist who was wrong. Scientist. Well, first of all, Jeannie isn't a, a, a geneticist. No, she, secondly, neither am I. I mean, the, the, I'm a little worried when, ever, when people make a mistake and say something, then suddenly it doesn't mean the science is wrong. It means the scientist is wrong. Well, I agree but, with that. But, I agree but, with um, that. You know, well, to I'm say sure. we affirmatively, it, it, I'm surprised Jeannie would say that because in science we generally cannot. Right. For, for, regarding things we don't yet understand, we can't affirmatively uh, argue with certainty. About anything. Well, th well, that's a great point. But you guys have, like you and Richard Dawkins, you guys appeared on stage together recently. Mm -hmm. You guys have fully conceded half of our argument. Well, I, I, right? I don't know which half. Well, I mean, okay, the, let me, the let me that, tell the, you. The universe had a beginning. If you want to go there, no, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. Richard Dawkins repeats everywhere he speaks that biology is the study of things that appear to be designed. And to explain what appears to be, on your part, the exquisite design of our universe, you believe that there are trillions of universes so that ours appears beautifully designed just by dumb luck. Because well, if you have second. septillions... All, well, let's stop a second. I yeah. don't even use the word believe. Scientists don't use the word believe. I don't believe anything. What the question is, what does the data tell me? What's more likely? What's less likely? What's been ruled out by the data? And in fact, the universe is not a particularly exquisitely designed for us. It's exquisitely designed to exist. It could be a lot better. In fact, we probably live in the worst of all universes for the long-term future of life. Yeah, we're, we're able to observe. Space, 
is non-zero. If it was zero, the universe would be better. Dr. Krauss, from our position, you say the sun is in an insignificant corner of our galaxy. From our position, unlike the vast majority of stars in our Milky Way, we are able to observe not only the Milky Way to an extraordinary degree, but the entire universe. We have such an extraordinary opportunity because of where we are. Well, it's not unique in by how you're right. We're lucky. We're actually, in fact, we're unlucky in a way. Yeah. We can observe the rest of the universe, but we can't observe most of our own galaxy. So it just well, depends. If we I mean, were... it's, like, it's like someone who lives on the other side of the track that's always yeah. greener. Well, and yeah, so, but if we were in the cluster, we right? We can see, but we are very unlucky. We can't see what we can't see. If we were in the cluster where most of the stars are in the center of our spiral galaxy, there would be so much interference, we might not be able to see hardly anything. Well, you know, the point is, we we don't exactly know, the, first of all, the conditions, uh, what what life would be like, for right. example, there. And you're absolutely right that if we were right in the center of our galaxy, probably, not only would we not be able to observe anything, but it'd probably be pretty hard for life to have evolved. But w because we're in the outskirts of the galaxy, uh, which is probably true for only, say, maybe 30 billion of the 100 billion stars in our galaxy. So we're one of 30 billion lucky stars, if you want to call it that, and, and that's fine. But, I mean, again, it's one of these things. Where it's, it would be very surprising for us to find ourselves in a place we couldn't live. Do you agree with that? Well, I mean, that, very, that's surprising for us to find ourselves Lawrence, involved. That, in a, that's it, like a doctor saying the reason your father is deaf is because he can't hear. No, it's not. It's, yes, I mean, it's, it's so same. much like, you know, like that. that anthrop very, it's not too surprising that we find ourselves in a place that's conducive for life. Well, Do you agree with that statement? I, I think that's a non sequitur. It's, well, uh, it, it's, that's a, it's, it's a, a word game to try it's, to explain. It's a tautology, not a non sequitur. Well, well, right. The extraordinary unlikelihood, the fine tuning of the physical properties of the universe, and then the extraordinary unlikelihood. That fine tuning of, you're talking about? I mean, I, I, you sound like you're an expert in this, and I assume you're not, but you're just, you're just spouting off some words that you've heard. So I'd like to know what fine tuning you're talking about. All right. I've been doing the show for 22 That's years, fine, five days a week. Science. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you program. the electron to proton mass ratio, right? It's one, two, 10 by what? 30 some zeros. No, the electron to proton mass ratio is 1 in 2000. 1 in 2000? Yeah. The electron to proton mass ratio? Yeah, it's 1 in 2000. Yeah, the electron weighs 1 2000th the mass of the proton. It's good we're, we're doing a little education here. Okay, well, you're absolutely right. I'm not talking about 1 to 1. I'm talking about in the entire universe. Oh, no. the elect Actually, there are an equal number of electrons to protons. The universe is new electrically neutral. All right. Well, you got me there. Good, okay. You got me there. Down. I have to accept your word because... Well, you don't have to accept no, my word. No, no, on a matter of on. fact... I don't want you to accept anything I what, said. No, well, well, you'd be so, as skeptical of On me a as matter of you. fact, you've got your degree from, what, MIT? You were MIT, at Harvard, yeah. Yale, Case well, Western, I'm, ASU. Yeah. I By the way, I studied at ASU back in the 80s, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Then I went to McDonnell Douglas Helicopter Company, Microsoft, and been a talk show host ever since. Mm -hmm. But so, okay, I apologize. I'll correct that. What thing There's are, are the finely tuned. tuned parameters, right? There's the gravitational force constant. Yeah, the, it is what it is. Well, oh, what do you mean it's fine tuned? There's the electromagnetic force constant. There's the ratio of the number of electrons to protons. So, Which is one. All right. So yeah. the reason that so many astrophysicists, cosmologists have gone to asserting the multiverse, that there are trillions upon trillions of universes, is because they say ours is such that... It is so wildly unlikely. No, there's no the good reason. reason for it to be here unless no, there no, were that's septillions. Not, that's, no, that's, that's not the case. And by the way, the multiverse is very speculative. And essentially, nothing, almost nothing that I've written about having to do with how the universe could come from nothing depends upon there being a multiverse. We've been driven to the multiverse by ideas in particle physics, which to some extent, naturally predict the existence of many different universes. Now, there are certain parameters, and you didn't mention any of them, yeah. I think, because you're not aware of them. Yeah, there are yeah. certain, which are, but in my book, I describe them in detail. There are certain parameters, like the energy of empty space, that's very inexplicable. We can't understand why the energy of empty space is what it is. Yeah, right. And one of the arguments that's been presented, and it's been done a number of times throughout the history of science, is called the anthropic principle, that namely, something along the lines of what you're saying, namely, if it were any different, then, then galaxies wouldn't form and life as we know it wouldn't form, etc. So if, there, if it's a random event, then, then if it were any different, we wouldn't be here. 
Now, I should say that that's a plausible and possible answer, resolution of that problem, and it's motivated in some sense by the possible existence of many universes, which are predicted by many particle physics theories. Mm. But in the, fact, in the past, when the anthropic principle has been applied to parameters we haven't understood, we've often found that, in fact, it's wrong, that we understand the parameters. It used to be the case for nuclear forces, that they had to be finely tuned so the stars would burn the way they were, and people thought, well, it's just anthropic. Well, now we have a fundamental theory called the strong interaction, which describes the interactions of quarks inside protons and neutrons that explains all that. And so all right. the, point, the point is that, yeah. you know, you're God of the gas Lawrence. argument, which I'm sure you don't really want to use. Lawrence. Just because we don't understand something, and if some scientists suggest one possibility is that it's a random variable, and it is what it is because we're here to measure it, is one possibility. But the fact that we don't understand it and, um, and, and it's inexplicable otherwise at present means there's a God. Well, that's a pretty bad argument, as you know, because right. the minute we understand it, your God's going to go out the window. Lawrence, in your book, as you've just said, you talk about nothing. <laughs> I mean, you talk about the geometry of space and the energy that fills the geometry of space. But to clarify, you're not denying, are you, that there are physicists around the world who have calculated the unlikely existence of these fine-tuned parameters and have looked at our universe and said that it is wildly, wildly no, I unlikely. No, I am denying that. Are you There's denying that? that? Yeah, I'm denying that because I'm no one shot. can calculate the probability answer. There are many people who are saying, look, the parameters of our universe seem rather strange. And maybe they're random, and, and it would be nice to calculate the probability that they occur. But we don't know the probability distribution over all universes because we don't know the underlying physics well, of and the this multiverse. Is, this so is no what's, one can calculate the probability distribution. Well, if they say they are, this is what This is what's driven people to say that there are at least 10 to the 500, 10 no, to the 500 that's, zeros that's, that's, sorry, universes. No, again, wrong. Go Hold ahead. On. The reason that people say there may be 10 to the 500 universes is some people who think that string theory might be a, a, a good theory at the basis with, of quantum gravity which you don't have pointed like. out that right. string theory predicts 10 to the 500 different universes. Yeah, and there are other physicists who are saying that number, that's a paltry number compared to the number of universes. There must be virtually infinite. Well, it could and be. then lo and behold, we find ourselves here in this one where we're able to exist. I'm, well, the point is, all of that may be true. I don't see what the problem, what your problem well, is. Well, I am surprised. Can I just object for the record that you're denying that there are a legion of physicists who look at the parameters of the universe, gravitational force constant, electromagnetic force constant, and so on, and they say this is very unlikely. Therefore, there's likely trillions of universes, and we happen to be in the one that supports our existence. Well, I'm shocked that you deny that. It's a case of people who stretch the truth. You've got one or two things right, but your conclusions are wrong. There are many physicists who, yeah. who argue that the parameters of our universe are difficult to comprehend. There are many physicists who point out that there are various fundamental theories that predict the existence of many different universes, and therefore one possibility to explain the parameters that we see is that they are randomly distributed over universes, and we only exist in the universes that allow life. Stop the tape. Stop the tape. Yeah. Hey, Bob always wanted to say that. <laughs> Fred, this happens through this discussion where Lawrence Krauss will say, like, he's never heard of an idea, and then he ends up saying, well, that's actually a pretty good idea, and there are people who claim that. He's consistent at contradiction. Lawrence Krauss said, like a good atheist, we don't believe anything. Yeah, he doesn't believe in believe. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't believe anything, but is there something rather than nothing? He said there absolutely is something rather than nothing. And that's a contradiction, fundamental contradictions throughout. Now, we have the advantage. We've heard the whole thing. I mentioned atheist scientists. He says, what's an atheist? What's an evolutionist? What are people? What What is Darwinism? What is Darwinism? They all do that. Like yeah, Eugene it's like Scott, a new talking, Aaron Roth. It's a new talking points with evolutionists. Yeah. And you'll hear this as we go on. He'll ask, yeah. what are people? So I'll say the discoverer of DNA and your friend, Richard Dawkins, say that maybe life came from outer space. He's like, why does he deny it at first? I never heard. I never heard anybody. Haven't you heard of panspermia? There's like 500,000 pages on the internet that talk about panspermia. I never heard of such a thing. And then... Within a few minutes, he's heard of it. Yeah. It's a reasonable theory, some people think. Yes. And Freddie just did that with this fine-tuning. 
He says, you know, many say that the parameters of the universe are difficult to explain. Maybe some randomness helps us explain it. That's exactly what I've been saying for the last five minutes. Exactly. He and contradicts he denies himself. It. He denies yes. it each time something comes up. He denies it. Then later he admits it. It's this quirk, this idiosyncrasy among evolutionists, atheists. It's a device to avoid actually talking about the substance and pretend that the person you're talking to is an idiot and they don't know anything. So you could just make believe you don't know what neo-Darwinism is, you don't know what anything is, it stays in their comfort zone. Yeah, and I believe when you're arguing from a position that you don't have a lot of evidence to support, you tend to use these kind of devices. So now he's admitted what he spent five minutes denying, that there are many, there are many physicists who say, well, maybe the fine-tuned parameters could be explained by this randomness of millions or trillions yeah. of universes. He also said, well, the Big Bang, they think time started at the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. So his lingo there was T equals zero. Yep. He said, so we don't know exactly at time equals zero or before, he said. And that made me think of J.R. Lucas, an Oxford professor, wrote a book called The Future. Brilliant book. And in this book, he says it's an incoherent concept to talk about what it was like before time. He said that's incoherent. Before T zero. Right. And these guys, including Stephen Hawking and Lawrence Krauss, they do that all the time. What happened before there was time? incoherent what you're saying is irrational can't agree more bob let's start the tape there are many physicists who point out that there are various fundamental theories that predict the existence of many different universes and therefore one possibility to explain the parameters that we see is that they are randomly distributed over universes and we only exist in the universes that allow life the problem with all of that of course is we don't even know what all sorts of intelligent life are we don't know if the parameters of our universe are vastly different whether a different source of intelligent life would, would evolve we don't know even if we're typical of life in the universe These when are questions that are Lawrence, questions at the forefront of physics which is why we continue to look out instead of trying to assume we know all the answers Lawrence, we're trying, here, here's we how assume it, we have the answers. here's how it looks to me by the way the book is a universe from nothing Lawrence Krauss afterward by Richard Dawkins uh, here's the way it looks to me. When Richard Dawkins joins the discoverer of DNA and so many atheists and evolutionists now saying that perhaps... Well, I don't know what you mean by atheists and evolutionists. I well, mean, there's some people who are atheists, some people about. are evolutionists, some people what are not. What do you mean by evolutionists? People who believe molecules to man evolution. Neo-Darwinism. What do you mean? Well, as I said, but can I tell you what they're anything. saying before you mean, The we... people who accept the evidence of, of, yes, of, of those empirical people. science. But, <laughs> yes, I mean, those... The same people who believe the Earth those, is round, for Those example. people... Well, the, the president of the Flat Earth Society is a Darwinist. Well, that, you know, they operate fine, but today. I'm just saying he's an idiot for being a president of the Flat Earth Society. I agree with you. See, we agree on something. Yeah, uh, no, exactly. Lawrence, and all I'm saying is there, Lawrence, there are no scientists who aren't evolutionists. Could I make my point? So you believe in gravity. Could I make my point so you okay. can tell me I'm wrong? They're on the same level of footing. When Richard Dawkins and so many atheists say that perhaps because of the complexity of molecular biology, they joined the discoverer of DNA in saying maybe life came here from aliens, they seeded life on Earth. And when physicists are saying there must be trillions of universes or there might be septillions or we can't even pronounce the number, it seems that they're merely punting to explain the complexity that we can see. They're proposing infinitely greater complexity. And so to explain one living cell on Earth, they posit alien civilizations, space travel, quadrillions of cells to explain one cell on Earth. Could you agree, Lawrence Krauss, that when they say that, they're merely punting? Well, I don't know. I'm, again, when you you're, you're you're it's like you're asking when did you stop beating your wife? I don't I don't concede that people are saying that. I've never heard people. You say have that. never heard. Well, heard How about panspermia? Hold on, hold on. At my institute that I run here at the university, the Origins Project, one of the things we look at is the origin of life, and what people are looking at is specific chemical reactions that could lead to the development of organic molecules. And I don't hear anyone talking about aliens or or I mean, you know, there's this idea of panspermia that, that that is an interesting possibility namely that the first organic molecules didn't evolve on earth but how about are, richard that, dawkins i transcribed well, richard, I'm with dawkins. richard dawkins all the time and I've never, he's never said that with me i watched this 15 times on video and i published the transcription on our realsciencefriday.com website dawkins said that the origin of life quote might have come about in this way 
The evidence may show, as we look at the complexity, as we look at the genetic mechanisms, that might be evidence that a long time ago, far, far away in another galaxy, that there was a civilization that evolved by Darwinian means, and that civilization designed life and seeded it on our Earth. Lawrence, he actually said a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, like he's watching well, he's Star Wars. Well, he's not an expert in astronomy. It's probably more likely by a star in our yeah, galaxy. Yeah, right. Anyway. So he said that along with, by my extrapolation of the atheist and evolutionist I debate, thousands have posited that life might have come here from aliens, including the co-discoverer of DNA, Francis Crick. I yeah, can't believe you've never heard of, of this theory. It's a fascinating idea. Yeah, but... Do you agree with me that they're only punting because if biological life is so complex that it couldn't evolve here on such a hospitable planet, then why would it evolve somewhere else? You got the same problems there as here. Don't well, you agree they're, they're just punting? Well, well, first of all, uh, the, the argument, there's no one I know who says that there's any evidence that life is too complicated to have evolved here. Stop the tape. We'll hear the rest next week. Hey, Bob. So I loved how he said that he'd never heard of panspermia. And then later he said it was an interesting idea. And then after that, he said it was a fascinating yeah, idea. I'm glad I could share it with him. Yeah. And I love that midsection jab you got to him on the flatter society guy being a Darwinist. <laughs> he said there are no scientists who don't believe in evolution. He must be cloistered like a nun or I guess a monk. <laughs> he must be. He hasn't heard of them. And also... They have conceded half of our argument. Yes. Richard Dawkins says that life looks designed, and he finally admitted, he did admit it, that the universe, it comes up in part two, but he already said it somewhat, is exquisitely designed to exist. Yeah, part two, David's going to go to town on Goliath. Oh, God bless you guys.